This is an obituary, a post-mortem, a brief biopsy analyzing a bloated corpse once beloved by millions, a series that has never lived up to its full potential, limping along for decades on marketing hype from a long gone era. This video was suggested on Twitter by at Tapia once, and originally I wanted to spend 10 minutes discussing why this series has never been amazing. But, after spending a few weeks playing as much Sonic as my stubby little fingers could handle, consuming as much Sonic content as humanly possible, I didn't think that was a fair assessment. Because, well, there is some good in the series. Yes, some good, but not much. Nintendo was beating Sega's plump little rump in the console wars. Sega needed a better mascot than this literal pile of human garbage they already had, Boy Alex or something like that. So in a grand sweep of market research and sheer boomer cunning, they cobbled together a figurehead that would be emblematic of 90s ratitude. Soon ads were popping up all over, promoting Sega as a more mature alternative to Nintendo. Look at this kid's game, you stupid kid. Try playing a real man's console for once. Mario was fat, lame, and old. Sonic was slim, neato, and blue. Sonic ate chili dogs and played in a hip and happening band to appease the jive crowd. He had the personality of a jazz solo cup and the charisma of a sex offender, but that didn't stop him from his main pursuit, speed. His sheer velocity was unmatched, so his games, they were fast? Well, that's what was advertised. In North America, the first Sonic game was bundled with the Genesis, just like Super Mario Brothers with the NES. It wasn't long before Sonic was a household name, like Mickey Mouse or Mayor McCheese. In a way, it was like artificially creating a cultural icon. Kids always want to see themselves as more mature than they really are, and they feel that consuming mature content inherently makes them appear more mature. And Sonic was seemingly more edgy than Mario, especially in this... Uh, this era. Yes, he was cool to the youth, but in a non-threatening way that parents would approve of. But if you've played this game and you remove the element of nostalgia, it's not all that great. Sure, in the grand scheme of 90s platformers, it's definitely in the top tier, but I think you'd be hard-pressed to find somebody who will take this over this. The camera is just so close to Sonic, it's likely to enhance the illusion of speed, but at the cost of being unable to react to any upcoming obstacles. Sonic himself is really not moving that quickly most of the time. You'll find yourself waiting for platforms to move, and if you try and beat the game as quickly as possible, you'll be taking leaps of faith that will often result in a early demise. But yes, you are supposed to learn the levels, the optimal routes, and eventually go fast. But most people won't ever reach that point, they'll simply move on to something else. There's no time trials mode to practice each individual level, so you'll just need to play the game over and over and over again. Most people exposed to Sonic weren't fully enjoying these games to their full potential, and meant they wouldn't come back. In the meantime, the internal business rumblings within Sega were rumbling. Traditionally, Japanese corporations don't look too highly on American employees, as well as Sega itself being notoriously difficult to work with in general. There was animosity between the Japanese division of Sega and its American counterparts, especially since the US team was really outperforming expectations. So some team members moved to America to get some distance between them and HQ. This team developed the sequel, which was better than the first. Less obstacles, better level flow, still no time trials though, which would help newcomers learn the game, but hey, these were early days. Super Mario World this was not, but again another top tier 90s platformer. Sonic's development teams were fractured and would remain that way, well, forever. Sega itself was just making terrible decisions as there was constant infighting between Sega of Japan and America. That's why there are so many conflicting accessories for the Genesis, one of which had what I consider to be the best 2D Sonic game. Developed for the Sega CD, this game nails down the Sonic platforming better than anything that's come before or after, with maybe one exception. Level design became more streamlined, it became easier to see what's coming ahead, and of course... And you get time trials, you can actually practice the levels. What, what a novel idea. Playing for the first time is a lovely experience, and it doesn't compromise the ability to master the game. But yeah, this game wasn't developed by the core Sonic team, so maybe that's why it was so good. Anyway, it was exclusive to the Sega CD, so it didn't sell particularly well, which again is a massive shame. It seemed like Sonic had finally found a formula that worked, but it didn't last. Again, the fractured development teams meant that Sonic 3 was from Sonic Team proper, 
To be honest, it feels like a massive step back. More roadblocks, water levels, and iffy level design. All the while, sales were dropping sequel after sequel. Marketing had created Sonic, pushed him into the public spotlight, but the games were just not appealing to the more casual players. They simply weren't fun unless you already played them over and over again. It wasn't as accessible as Mario or Adventures in Typing with Timon and Pumbaa, which meant many people moved on to other seemingly better games. Also, people were getting hyped over the new 3D gaming fad. Sony already made the jump into the console sphere and we got Crash. Nintendo gave people the gold standard for 3D platformers and Sega. Well, a lot of people just forgot they existed. Sega's internal conflicts were starting to manifest as external issues, and it resulted in a hiatus for the Sonic series. There was a Sonic game in development at this time, one that would never see the light of day. Development was split into two teams, each working on two different engines and a deadline that could not be met. The Saturn was quickly dying, Sega was ready to give up and try again, and this project got scrapped. But it wasn't a complete waste of time, some of the ideas for Sonic Team's version of the game were implemented into a new project, one that was designed originally as an RPG adventure, but eventually became... It was the first massive title for the Dreamcast, a big 3D Sonic game, and really the first main Sonic game since Sonic 3. A lot of hype surrounded this game, and it's not hard to see why, but it's not good. The RPG elements of going around and seeking out items, trying to figure out where to go, it all works well in a RPG. In a Sonic platforming game, it ruins any semblance of pacing, not to mention the less than ideal controls and camera. The levels varied from auto-running sections to, again, arbitrary roadblocks, but the biggest issue was... Watch out! You're gonna crash! Ah! But setting up a precedent for Sonic as a narrative-driven game was the worst decision in Sonic's history. No longer a silent protagonist, he became everything uncool. Don't criticize. The writing in these games share the eloquence of a fourth grader's report on Tiananmen Square, and the animators seem to have given Sonic one too many chromosomes, and it set the precedent for a basic storytelling structure nearly all future games would follow. Sonic and Tails are on their honeymoon. Some emo OC finds them and wants the Infinity Stones. OC gets Infinity Stones. Dr. Egg Guy wants Infinity Stones. Sonic is Werehog. Sonic is creepy, big as cat. The moon explodes. Sonic is apathetic, but decides to save the day anyway. And you win. Or Sonic dies. There's so much focus on these cutscenes, and I have to assume nobody, and I mean nobody, cares about this. Those that grew up with the original game started to outgrow the series. Sonic was taking himself far more seriously than a blue hedgehog should. And the Dreamcast wasn't selling well either. Sonic had taken years off without a proper release, and sales numbers for the game represented that. To me, it seems like the hiatus of Sonic in the late 90s really lost him a lot of public mindshare. While we have this perspective of Sonic being a massive gaming mascot, he really wasn't all that relevant once the Genesis era ended. Sega was out of the console business, and Sonic Sonic went multi-platform. Sonic Adventure 2 came out, and it was actually pretty good. The Sonic levels were a huge improvement over the first game, and the story was, well... Uh, my biggest complaint would be that two-thirds of the game revolve around piloting a mech and digging for thingies, but it doesn't ruin the game. Sonic had entered a new, more complicated era. Almost all the original team members of Sonic Team had left. The new edgy Sonic wasn't resonating with older gamers as well. And to cap it off, a pachinko company, Sammy, went forth with a hostile takeover of Sega. To the exact degree how this affected Sega is unknown, but it didn't make the future of Sonic any brighter. Yuji Nami the head of Sonic Team leaves. At first it seemed random, but then the world saw what they were working on. Sonic! Sonic! Wait! I can't run that fast! Don't worry! Just raise your head and run! You already know about this game. You know how bad it truly is. And you probably know that Sonic games haven't garnered the greatest reaction ever since. More auto-running, more glitches, more camera issues, all the bad in the adventure series was expanded upon and everything that was okay was thrown out. 
You got gimmicks trying to reinvent the formula, but nothing sold that well or received the greatest critical reception. Even the best of these modern Sonic Team games, like Generations, is really just a subpar platformer banking on nostalgia. Yes, there are a few decent levels, but it comes at the cost of hundreds of bad ones. All this stuff is crafted to make the playtime artificially longer, the only thing keeping you around being brief moments of joy while suffering through a slog of this. Now in a post-Sega Council world, Sonic has become the very thing he was meant to destroy. He is now the antithesis of cool, his viscous fluids of ratitude have overflowed. Banking on nostalgia doesn't work when your older audience has already left. Sales dropped more and more and more. But then, this happened. Now this game wasn't even made by Sonic Team, but a small team of fans. It was still published by Sega, but yeah, it was great. Really great. It wasn't about nostalgia or pandering, but instead taking the classic games and reinventing them. People called it a return to form, the glory days of Sonic coming back. And I have to agree. I mean, it's really more of a return to Sonic CD, not 1, 2, or 3, because, well, the CD was good. The levels were altered to flow better. The game is just a faster experience. It nails down what Sonic should have been 25 years ago, but it didn't sell that well, and if the games would continue this trajectory, maybe things would be different, but it did not. Soon, we got the worst the Sonic series has to offer. Sonic Forces, the newest game? Well, it sold just 100,000 copies. Who knows how many people just bought it for the memes, but uh, hey, Guitar Hero followed the same path, and when it hit that 100,000 threshold, it was done. Now, Sega has this character as its mascot, so maybe they'll try to reinvent it again, but would anybody ever care? The upcoming movie will probably end up hurting the brand even more, cementing it as a dead 90s icon trying to become relevant. And after playing these games, trying to watch the shows, I, I came across one Sonic product that I feel best represents the series. I purchased the Sonic Gems collection for GameCube, simply to play one game I've always been interested in. And honestly, I was not disappointed. No, this is not a joke. I genuinely love this game. The controls are not that bad, contrary to popular belief. The maps are a bit complicated, but easy to learn. There's no chance of a race being ruined by a last place enemy throwing a shell, since, well, there's no items. The only thing I can say is, yes, those levels have seemingly no flow, and you'll have to figure out a route that works for you. And after looking into it, these levels were designed by Sonic Team, while Traveler's Tales handled the rest. So yes, Sonic Team does ruin everything. But since the camera isn't so close, you can see where you're going. The bad levels don't ruin the experience. And there is a time trials mode so you can learn what you're doing. So I kept playing it and playing it and playing some more. And finally, I ended up here on speedrun.com where I'm currently on the leaderboard for every track in the game. And see, this is what Sonic is all about. Or at least should have been. Going fast, playing the same level over and over and over again Again to see yourself getting better each time, learning new tricks, new techniques, and applying them, and finally feeling content with your progress. No story, no cringe, just a charming experience. And that's why I say Sonic R is the best Sonic game of all time. But now, I think it's safe to say the series is dead. It would make sense for Sega to put the franchise on another hiatus, regain some credibility, and try again in a decade or so. Sure, the character might lose some relevance, but then again, he's only relevant now because he's so f***ing annoying. This is Tyler of Knowledge Hub.